And what we have here is I came up with the workshop here. It's a four pager. We're going to talk about this today uh, in order for you to be able to expand and put some icing on top of your shawls. Now that's assuming that you all like shawls and uh, uh, just hang on a second. I just got to click on something here on my thing. So you like shawls, but this whole idea with this particular concept is to be able to add borders on. So I find with the Facebook, for example, is that when somebody does just a regular blanket, oh, that's nice. They throw on a wicked border and all of a sudden it's love, 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 love. I have to have it. And then they're like seagulls, pattern, 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 pattern. Do you not get annoyed with that? You know, when you see like seagulls calling for patterns, it's kind of, um, um, kind of interesting how we go from there. So um, it is very much like seagulls. We have to agree, right? They don't even say nice job. They just say pattern, pattern. Come on, please. So hit that love button and say, by the way, is there a pattern? You know, it just takes a few extra keystrokes and uh, you never know. You could be making somebody's day by them wanting to share. So this kind of concept, I uh, actually have the shawl here. And if I uh, come back up to me, Hamana from Mexico, she is here. So we have the actual shawl here that the model is wearing. And um, this is using Karen Latte Cakes, which they still have the label on it from the model. And uh, this is what it looks like. Okay, so does anybody like those Karen uh, Latte Cakes? They're really quite special. I like how it changes the color without having to change the ball because not all of us like to change tails because God forbid there's not on the ball or something. And people are like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So this is the great thing. You can just actually enjoy this yarn and it just plays its own color. So that's kind of fun. And so basically it has no border added to this one here. I'll let you in a secret. There's the same pattern on yarn inspirations.com with an actual pattern with an actual border. It's the exact same thing, but they just put a border and I'll talk about that in a little bit too. So what we want to do is we want to kind of add borders to different things. And so I'm just going to slam this aside. So I was making a shawl just for the fun of it. I haven't written the pattern, so don't ask me. I don't want to hear the, the seagulls today. So what we have here is that a, another shawl that in the making, and this is using unforgettable. That's what you are. So anyway, so I kind of come up with this kind of concept. Um, I think a lot of people seem to like um, the idea of, of holes you know, and it gives, it gives it a little bit of uh, interest. So using Unforgettable and it's transitioning so slowly. So I like that yarn. So anybody like Unforgettable? So that's kind of fun. So I don't know what I'm gonna do for a border because that's the whole point of this workshop today. So I also have other things that I wanna show you. So you do a blanket, right? And all of a sudden, so this is actually the um, Iran um, blanket from Yarn Inspirations. It's a tutorial sample that I did. And what this is, is see the border. I've never done a border like that. And I thought to my point of view, what can you do with a shawl with this kind of border, with these kind of picos, a little bit of edging. So what you can do is rip off, I mean, copy the idea of a border from something like this and slam it onto your, your, your shawl, right? And then I was thinking more and more, is that when we get into other things, so this is an actual sampler, a Christmas sampler that we did earlier this year, and it's so pretty. And there's stitches in here that you could actually probably use as well for your borders, for your, your ideas. So it's actually really neat how you can just look at something that you already have and to be able to determine what you would like to do with it. So um, hopefully that's making some sense. The other thing that you can do is that if you haven't designed anything or crocheted anything that's um, exciting, you can just look at crochet border books like this. And this is uh, Edie Ackman's one of my favorite uh, designers for, um, um, for this kind of concept. And so she has a ton of ideas, including a different um, stitching diagrams in order to make it work. And the wonderful thing about that she does in her books, which may get you excited, depending on how, how excited you are today, is that I believe near somewhere in this book, she has all the different orders for all different kinds of concepts. So you can just take what you already have and slam on a border from something like this really quite easily. So that's what we kind of have. So, and then you can just look at regular stitch guides. So this is my first ever crochet book that I ever bought when I was 14, so I still have it. And so you could just be able to flip through, find something that you love and slam it onto your shawl. 
So let's uh, take a little bit of consideration. So let's Humana from Mexico City. Let's go back to the table. So what we have here is that we have a workshop that we have in, and Ali's provided the link to you if you would like to follow along, but you can just stay with me on camera and I'll point things out to you. So I'm gonna pull my Vanna today. So what we have here is that you have the shawl just like she's wearing here. So what, she's, what you can do is that you can wear it just like that if you would like to, but if you would just like to add on something extra, what you can just do is that, and don't think nobody does it because we all do it, is that we can look at another shawl design and see how they finished on how to, how they finished it with different kinds of borders. So the concept is to be able to take this border and move it to there or this border and essentially any border that you have to do. So the step one that we have to do is that we have to consider that whatever we decide has a stitch and repeat. So you're going to need to have to count the stitches from one side to the other. So not all the way, just one side, because we need to get the balance point with this. You see most shawls in a point like this, and you can also even do like blankets. So pretend this was the corner of a blanket, you could do the same thing. And you wanna count the number of stitches it is. Now, if you're getting the wrong count, so one side is like 71 and the other is 70, fake it, okay? That's what we do best here on the crochet crowd is that you have to sometimes fake it in order to make it because I'd rather fake it than frog it. So um, can we get some love for some like faking it? I tell you, it works every time. So if we're looking at something special, like uh, something like this, you're going to want to know the amount of stitches that it takes to do that in order to get everything so it looks even. If you're a person that doesn't care about looking even, then just slam in your stitches and, and um, fake it when you can. So if you're doing like fringe, does anybody actually like fringe? You know that, um, that, that, that fringe, you know? I don't know if I like fringe. Um, I don't know if it washes really well and then it seems to catch in my zipper. There are certain things I don't like catching in my zipper and uh, certainly fringe is one of those things. And so I don't want to ever zip up my thing and get that. So, um, so fringe can either make or break a project. So if I'm going to do fringe, I'm going to do a thicker fringe because thicker is better. And uh, that's what Allie always tells me too. So um, what we have here is that if you're not going to worry about any of the kind of um, special stitches, you don't need to worry about counting, just slamming something and make it look good. So what we have here is that I'm going to just take you through some mathematics. And I know you're saying, oh my God, there's math on a Saturday. So what we have is that the to the point shawl that we have up here, in order to get a certain border to it, we have to figure out how many stitches there are. So there's 113 stitches from the edge to the chain two space of the corner. And what I want to consider is that I never, I consider it like a bowling alley. So I consider that the last stitch and the first stitch of a side is considered the gutter. Does that make any sense? Please type in yes, if that makes any sense. So it's, I consider it the gutter. So in the sense that I want to get my stuff in between the gutters. So it's the, the, the one stitch and the one stitch on the other side. So I usually, if there's 113 stitches, I will subtract out the gutters. So how many gutters are there? It's like bowling alley, there's gonna be two. So there's gonna be one gutter and one gutter. So if there's 113, I remove the gutters and now I have, 100 and, um, I have 111 stitches left. Now when I have 111 stitches left, I wanna figure out what I can do for a multiple for this. And I know we're probably losing some of you here, but we'll try our best. So we have to figure out what number can we play with? Not every stitch count. If you're doing something fancy and there's like a multiple four. So if you looked at here, what is 111 divided by, and just try small numbers like three, five, seven, or nine, and you can find out what the information is. As soon as you get an even number without any decimal points, you know that whatever that is, it's going to be the multiple for, that you'll be able to use. So in this case, 111 divided by three gives 37 uh, sets. The other ones here are 22.5, 15.8, 12.3. those won't work, but three will work. So if I'm thumbing through a book, and Edie Ekman has this in her books, is that she will tell you in the multiples, this is a multiple of two, so I can't use that one. And I just keep on thumbing through, and you can see multiple of eight, you can pick something from these books that matches the multiple of what we're about to match. And so you can see really fun stuff when you go to do that. So for example, say you wanted to play with something. So we know three can be done there. 
but you really want a particular stitch that's going to work. So what we have here is that if we increase the number of rows, we can increase that 111 to 115, 117, 119, if you keep on going and going, and that will change the, the multiples that you can get. So if you go to 115 stitches here, you can do multiples of five. And if you change it to 117, you can get three, nine, or 13. So what I'm saying to you is that if the, if the design that the designer is giving you is giving you a number that you really don't want, there is nothing stopping you from adding an extra row. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes these multiples require you to have an even number. So for example, what would you do, and I'll leave this for you to type it in if you feel like it, but um, what would you do if it was an odd number and you want to make it even, where would you fake it? Boop, 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 boop. Boop, 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 boop. So what, uh, here we go, in the middle, in the side. So what I would do if it were me is that I would fake it either in the beginning of a row and at the end of the row so that both sides are then become an even number. I would fake it right on the edge of, of, the, of, of the shawl. And so therefore it's kind of easier to hide. So if you want to do that, you can do that as well. So what you can do is that you can look around and you can determine the different things. So we have a whole section of borders on the crochet crowd where you can take different concepts like this. And once you understand the multiple, you can rip this off and put it onto a particular shawl. Here's the trick. When it's fringe or when it's tassels or anything like that, anybody like tassels? And uh, what you can determine is that if you have an even number that goes across, what you can do is that you can skip every other one and then you end up on the point. Now, if it's an odd number, you are going to end up with the one just before the point, but there's nothing stopping you from putting something in the point and then continuing on the other side. So if you count and determine what that is, instead of guessing and, and just getting all the way through and say, damn, you know, I missed a stitch or something, you can figure that out in advance so that you know where to position the tassels and the fringe, right? So this is kind of, um, uh, something that you can consider. So for me, I would save my time, just count, and then I can figure out what I'm gonna do. So is it gonna be odd, even? And sometimes uh, some of these designers just put the fringe right at the end anyway, so they don't worry about the other stuff. And so that's how you would be able to determine your placement for that. Now, what's really trending right now is actually twisted fringe. Anybody, has anybody actually done the twisted fringe? We have videos on this as well. Um, so what we have, the twisted fringe. I love this twisted um, fringe. So what this is, instead of those dangly um, kind of fringe that kind of hangs and catches into your zipper, what this is, is that it's a, like a, a, a loop. So let me just see if I got a piece of yarn here. So I got a hook and I'll show you how it's done. So what they're doing, I'm just grabbing this tangled up yarn that I have. This is from last week's class. So what they're doing is that they're creating, let's just create a slip knot and I'll show you what they, how it's done. So what you do is you crochet along the edge of something and then you just pull through and then you pull through like an eight inch loop, something like that. And this would be attached to the project. And all you would just do is spin. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and 30. So look what's happened. So it's really, see? And when I go to release this, because it, I can feel the pressure, it's going to wrap onto itself. And then I just go and slip stitch into the next stitch. But when I slip stitch, what I want to do, so when I slip stitch, I'm going to slip through here and also the loop that's on the hook. So when I go in, I'm gonna pull through and the one on the hook. And what I'm gonna do is just create this and I'm just gonna pull this open like this and it just, and just let it naturally twist onto itself. So each yarn is kind of different. So I think there might be too many twists with that. And that's how you would get a twisted fringe. 
So you see it as saying like it's a lot better than just dangling and you don't have to worry about that um, fraying. So the trick would be is do you want to do every one like that because you're going to have to count 30 and 30 and 30. But if not, you can do every other one. So you could like single crochet in the next one and then do the next one just to be a fringe. But it's really neat and it won't come undone because it's been, it's gone through the major loop like that. So this is what you're seeing here with the twisted fringe. Um, so it looks really cool. So um, you could do much longer than eight inches if you would like to. You can spin it even more times if you want to. But the trick is to spin it enough times so that it doesn't want to really completely coil up, right? So that's kind of neat. So this here has been written on there, and here is part of the Karen Cakes uh, latest um, alley. Can you get the link for that? This is the Sampler Blues uh, blanket, and what this is here is that they they twisted fringe, and this instruction is from the Sampler Blues blanket on how that's done, and uh, they were using the Karen Anniversary cakes. So this is kind of a neat idea. So not hard to do at all. So you can do that like every other one. So if you wanted to do the odd number or the even, it wouldn't matter, right? You just have to choose whatever you want, right? So that's kind of fun. So what we have here is that, okay, here's where you're gonna blow your mind. This is where I lose everybody today. So what we have here is that we have this really gorgeous shawl that's been done. And this border here is a multiple of several borders. And the trick is, is that we have to figure out what we need to do in order to start this. So we know that in another pattern, this is all written out. And this is, I believe, the, the comfort shawl um, um, alley. And what we have here is that all these instructions are written out and they provided a crochet diagram for us. Now I'm a diagram uh, reader, reader in that sense. And, in this, and I can look at this and figure out how many stitching repeats that I have to do. So what I, my goal would be in order to get it from the other shawl to this one is that I can look at it and try to determine how many that I'm going to need in order to get it. As soon as I have the right number on my shawl that I'm working on, I can move this border then into the other shawl. So if you know how to read, does anybody not know how to read stitching diagrams? The, the diagrams are like wonderful. I'm learning how to write or to actually draw them, which is a nightmare. Um, but anyway, it's really an interesting thing. If you ever get time, we have a free um, on the article that this download is available. You can actually, uh, there's an actual free workshop. It's 30 minutes on how to read diagrams from the basic. And the, the fact is you just go step by step in order to do it. So what you're looking at here is the blue, but just in diagram format. So what's the difference between the blue writing and the black writing? Anybody can tell me. So we have free tutorials available for that. So right side, wrong side. Now it's just to tell you which side. So when you're looking at it easily, you can see that <laughs> what line you're working on. So if I'm like black, 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 when I look away and go into my project, I just go, okay, I'm still on black and I keep on going. So it's just an easy way for visualization of being able to actually follow it along. So myself, I'm learning how to uh, draw these things. So I'm having to do the same thing. So um, it's just a visual to make it easier for you. And industry standards says black and blue. So that's kind of why you always see black and blue as an option. So it's almost like uh, highlighting every other line but just using a different color. So what we have here is that you can see on row number 18 here is that we have to start with this particular one. So we have to figure out the amount of stitches that we have in order to get there. So I figured out that there's 12 stitches for the repeat from one side to the other. So I count from the one that you see here of the pyramid to the one just before the pyramid before the next one. So then I counted that there's 12 stitches and I'm looking to the row below to count how many stitches that is. So why is it not finished here? If anybody can tell me that. So where to go learn how to read a crochet diagrams is on the same uh, uh, article for this particular download. It's because it repeats. So if you said it's because it's repeating, um, that's great. Now, if you ordered McDonald's at this point, you're on the wrong class. So it's just showing you the repeat. So what you're seeing here is actually, this one here is actually this. So it's showing you how it's repeating over and over and over. So for us, 
class, I'm just like, okay, I look, look, look. And I'm like, once I get here, I'm like, okay, I can see that it's repeating and I keep doing it until I get close to the corner. And then I turn the corner and it's showing you how to do that. So they don't need to show you like really a small format. So there's 12 stitches that make this up. But what we have to fa factor in is that it's not just 12 stitches. There's actually something even more. So when I looked at this sample here, how many repeats of this do we see? And if I highlighted it with the red line, there's one, two, three, four, and five. So if you look at it, you will be able to see that you can see five of these. One, two, three, four, five. But wait a minute, I still have stuff before the border. The, so what, or before the corner. So I have extra stitches here. And so what I figured out is that there's an extra, extra left over. So do you see how this one ends here? Then I have those extra left here. And that's how I get that number. So when we're going to look at it, the instructions stated for this particular shawl that it was 140 stitches on the row, not row, row, row. So I divide that number by 70 stitches per side. So that gives me 70. So I know that there's 70 stitches between here and here as per the instruction. So that 70 is my goal in order to kind of work it out in order to get it done in my particular project. So I figured out that the repeat here is that I take 70 stitches and I divide it by 12 because that's what I saw the repeat to be. And it gives me 5.8. Now 0.8 is one of those things where we know that it's not just five, it's 5.8. So we have to round down to the closest whole number, which is five. I then take five and I times it by the number of repeat to give me 60. So we know that the answer is 70, but now right here, five times 12 equals 60. So I have 10 stitches left over in order to play. So I have 12 sets, 12 stitches. So 12, 12, 12, and the very final number here is 10. So that will give me that information so that I'll be able to figure that out. And I know some of you are probably like really lost at this point, so I'll, I'll try. I'll keep trying. So I have crickets in my house, well, in my studio here. <laughs> so what we'd like to do is that we would like to take this border and apply it to that border that we had that that model is wearing right here. But the fact is, is that it won't fit right where that designer has have, have us finished because we realized that the end of that pattern, there was 113 stitches. So we know that that number is not going to work in order to get that 12 and plus the 10, right? So I need to get, and what else do we know about that? 12 plus 10 equals, sorry, um, 70 is an even number. So the fact is, is that whatever I'm going to do, this particular shawl that the model is wearing is that it's never going to work. So that's what I, I was telling you, you got to fake it right at the beginning or the end of a row by adding in that extra stitch, right? So we have to fake that in. And so I would add it and place three stitches on the beginning or the end, the end of that row in order to get that to work. Now, we have to figure out the repeating. So right now is that if I have 114 stitches and I divide it by 12, that equals nine and a half repeats. I want an even number. So nine times 12 equals 108. And then I'm gonna add the extra 10 stitches. So that gives me to 118. So what I need to do is that the project's written to finish at 113. I need to finish that project so that I get 118. And then I can slam this border onto this shawl by getting to that number. Now, if you said to yourself, I'm quitting, I really don't want to um, be able to, um, to crochet anymore, you can frog it out and find out what the other denomination would be in order to get smaller so that maybe you'll take out a whole um, chevron piece there. So you can go in either way. So I would add extra in my case because it's easier. So what I would like to do is that I realize that I just need to do two more rows of the existing shawl and fake in that extra stitch at the beginning of the end of the row, and I can take this border and slam it onto the other, right? So it is a lot of math, but honestly, this is the kind of things that 
you should know if you, if you if you really want to go into another level and to be able to take something off something and still have your project sit right so i don't classify myself as a designer but i know how to do this kind of stuff now i tell you i would sit in grade four and i would cry and cry and cry because it took me forever to be able to learn how to do the times tables so i end up going into remedial math and a remedial the, you know the special math um, and then I never understood how to do fractions so I cried my way through grade six on fractions uh, you know where they do three over a quarter I still don't understand that to this day I understand that's three quarters but I don't understand how to multiply and add them together so I would cry my way through there and uh, it was awful so mathematics is probably my weakest subject um, I literally got um, uh, two out of a hundred on uh, on my math tests and because you got two points for spelling your name right oh my god so it was that it was that bad so the my point being is that if this is hard for you i i'm speaking from uh personal experience you got to cut yourself some break you just put on the coffee and the tea and just slowly work your way through this particular process in order to do it and I tell you, once you start understanding how this is all going to puzzle together, you can actually um, be able to see what you can do. And so, for example, say you have a blanket, like I talked about earlier in this broadcast. Let me take the blanket. And you know that the blanket is a certain width like this. I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to lay my shawl over top of this. And I know it works for that. I count the number of stitches and I match my stitch count to that. And this will work. And the wonderful thing about it is that because it's a blanket, it already has the point. So this could be the point right there, right? So I ignored the middle part and this can suddenly go onto my particular shawl, right? So the thing that you wanna watch for the most is that the right side and the wrong side. So if it matters on your shawl, sometimes it matters. And what we have is that you wanna crochet it on the, on the side that is suggesting on the blanket. So this is called the Aran blanket. Ali, it's the green one on your inspirations if you wanna provide a link. But this is the Aran. We have a tutorial available if you like texture. So my point being is that you can add different things that you see in blankets all over the place to be able to do this particular concept. Um, for example, this uh, shawl that I'm working on now, I wanna keep whatever I'm doing to the shawl to be kind of simplistic. This one here is relatively flat and I want the lines to be the feature, but I see this fringe on the baby dress. Um, Ali, if you wanna pull up the pattern for the little sweetie dress, the little sweetie dress has a really beautiful border on the bottom of the girl's dress that I would apply to this. So what I can do is that I can look at that particular pattern on your inspirations, there's videos on it too. And you can take that border of the fringe of the girl's dress and apply it to your shawl, right? So, and don't think that we don't do that. So I have been crocheting so long that I'm like, I really love a certain look that I can just kind of manipulate. And then I can thumb through my books to find out what I really would like to do. And maybe I want to add some like different things and you can look at it. And the wonderful thing of if they have the stitching multiples here, they tell you what it is. Multiples of five plus two. So multiple, I'm looking for five. So that, that would work if I had a multiple of five and I could apply that into that particular concept, right? So you could just literally just thumb through these things. And you know, there's all kinds of free patterns available. Your inspirations has like 7,000 of them. Um, so you can just look. And what you can just do is look, look at the borders of different things in order to get it. So the actual Christmas sampler blanket that we did I actually didn't realize, I've never seen a border done like this before, where it's a two layer. You could do that, right? In order to get it to work. And it's something so simple that it would take a project that would be considered just like really simple. And it gives it that extra final touches to make it look finished. Is it, am I making any sense? Shake your head, I can see you. Yeah, it's making sense, yeah. So Angela says yes. And uh, there we go. And so it's just that kind of a, an interesting thing where you can rip off different things. Now here's, if you really wanna get special, you really wanna hit that love button on the social media, I'm telling you books like this are like the cat's ass. It's really awesome. So what you can just do is that you can look at different things with inside Mandela's itself and say, I really want that. Now, yes, it's round, but you can look at it and say, 
and determine how it's done. And what you can just do is manipulate it so that it will work to your particular projects, right? So I really highly recommend, and I take lots of notes as you can see, but um, what I highly recommend is that you look at these kind of books and say, I want that. How do I get it to my particular idea? So you can see everything's in the round. So maybe instead of looking at it from a round point of view, you look at it from a piece like that. And suddenly you can take that little section out of here and apply it to your particular project, right? So there's all kinds of resources out there like that are just available. Um, I cannot recommend, um, Al, or sorry, Edie Ekman enough. Her particular concepts that she has go from the absolute just really cool stuff and to be able to finish. So that's a multiple too. So if you have an even number, you can slam that in. She shows you how to turn the corner and she has a diagram. So it's kind of a neat idea, right? So you can just really be creative in any way possible. So the idea here, icing on the cake, who's the artist in the end? It's you, right? Um, so our Mandela's are yesterday's filet. Uh, so you can do really, hey, that's kind of a fun one. I don't particularly like doing these curly cues. I like it for doll hair, but you know, um, single crochet back on a chain that will take forever but you know those are one of those items that it depends what you're going to be using it for and uh, what people's application but you, when you see it like this and say so I love this one like that would be fun you can apply it and there's nothing stopping you from mixing and matching different things right yeah so uh, so that's what I would consider doing is there any questions Ali is there any questions I've been yapping for like ever. Oh, goodness. Um, could you just remind everybody of the name of this book there? What, this book? This is yes. called The Round the Corner. So literally on the crochet cruises that I host, I have literally bought hundreds of copies of these, these books and put them in people's activity packages. This is a definite must have as far as I'm concerned. It's the best book there ever was. And I like how small it is. So you can put it in your project bag and it doesn't take up a lot of room. And literally you have everything that you possibly need to know. Now there's one particular, um, so Edie Ekman works with other people. So I think it's number 26 because I have no life and I remember that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, um, so what they do is that some designers from Yarnspirations actually ask for permission. And so sometimes you see a Yarnspirations pattern have a particular design right from Edie Ekman put onto the end of a blanket. So it's kind of fun when they do that. So that's kind of fun. And so I have two books here. Does anybody know the difference of the books? Other than this is my original book. I bought it for $12.95 Canadian, which at that time would have been a lot of money because I was young. And so what you have to watch out for these books, there's two books. So this book here, I got it on Amazon as a used book and it's got somebody's name on there, which I don't know who it is. But anyway, this is the original book that I bought and my bus ticket from going to college for the first time is in this thing. And what it is here is that these books look the same, but they're actually completely different. And so when you look at it from this perspective, so I learned how to do crochet and I'm Canadian. So I learned how to do uh, crochet from a British perspective. So my single crochet isn't single crochet. It's like a double crochet, if that makes any sense. So this original book that I bought from Lewis Craft, anybody that remembers that store. But anyway, all of the language here is actually in British. But I didn't know that because, you know, I was learning how to crochet, right? So th this book here, so I went and bought this book uh, a few um, years ago. And then I realized that this book is actually Americanized and North Americanized. So that's what the kind of concept is. So I had to look at it here and actually get to understand it of what the difference of the books were. So that's something that you just need to keep an eye on, making sure that the language is actually right for you. And uh, either way, they're good. The diagrams are still done the same way. It's just the language is different with the two. And uh, anyway, I cannot even believe I still have this book after all these years. So that's kind of something that you can look for uh, when you're looking for pattern books and et cetera. Now the Mandela book that I showed you, there's all kinds of errors in this book. Um, but the wonderful thing about it is that if you ever learn how to read these diagrams, okay, they're really hard to be able to design something like this and catch all the writing. But so there's mistakes in some of the writing. That's why my notes are here. But if you're looking at the diagram, the diagrams are usually right. So this is one of those things where it's right here, but explaining it doesn't always get that. So 
my point being is that sometimes people get hung up and, and they look at it and they said, oh my God, the words make no sense. But if you look at and you know how to read these, you realize that the designer may have said, slam something in a chain uh, eight space and there's no chain eight space. You realize that they just did a typo and that, that's kind of what happens. Uh, so there's all kinds of uh, errors. So single crochet over chain three. So this was uh, something that I, you know, I write notes. I don't have an issue with writing my books because they're fun. And that's kind of the, something that you have to watch out for. So that's kind of interesting. Any other questions? Any questions at this point? I know that I'm yapping a lot. So where can we find this video? So you'll be able to find the video I, as I talk to. So um, it's the actual video is already on the Crochet Crowd. There's actually two videos for this. So um, on your inspirations, there's actually a border that's been done with this. And the border, if you go to the last page of my handout, so you can, you can do the fringe, you can do tassels, anybody like tassels? I think tassels have their place. Make sure that if you're gonna do tassels, make sure you tie them on with the same color that is the main project. Because then if you ever have to wash it, then you can just undo the tie and just put it off to the side, wash your afghan, and then retie it with a, a bow tie back on. So you can have that. So here, this is the actual same blank, our um, um, shawl that this one is here. And this is called a make it a point shawl. This one's called make a point shawl. And anyway, it has what this is, is it's this fringe. And so what it is, it's like chaining a 10 or something, and they slip stitch along the edge so that it thickens up the fringe. Right. And so we have those particular, so we have both of these already filmed for you that as well. So you have, you can get started. And then I kind of show you easy ways to be able to remember how to do the, the stitch work. So if as a educator, I always get hung up on half double crochet. Has anybody ever screw up their corners when they're using half double crochet? That is just a nightmare of a stitch to identify. So I finally, after like 30 some odd years, I finally can see where the corner is on a half double crochet using these damp stitch alongs that people like screw up and what they're screwing up is the visualization of a corner for a half double crochet. So I found with myself is that I had this real sample. So I, and I said, where is the designer, where's the home crochet putting this in? And then I actually saw where they're putting it in because I normally go into the before the stitch and she goes in after, but then this one is after. So, you know, I don't think it really matters so much as long as you try. And then um, don't tell anybody, but sometimes when they have half double crochet in projects, I substitute it for double crochet. And I say, screw this crap. I'm going to do it my own way because I know I'm going to screw up. So there's a beautiful shawl on yarnspirations.com. It's using uh, Karen Cakes. I could not get that stitch to work at all. And, uh, and it's just because it's just half double crochet and then I did it in double crochet and I was happy. So um, I just want you to be able to understand is that there's no crochet police, you know, you have to adjust to your education. So I told you during this broadcast that I would cry my way through math class. I found my own way to learn by just getting visuals, learning how to read diagrams. And so I wasn't getting hung up on different things. So if you want to bring the camera back up, uh, so um, my point being is that, you know, your education, you know how you learn. So there's nothing stopping you from being able to do that. So um, last week, I actually posted a photograph of myself being at the age of 15 with my very first computer. I was a CD student, like D isn't dumb. Anyway, I was not a very smart kid. So anyway, my parents ended up getting us a computer, an IBM 286. And I decided I wanted to learn how to type. So I would go home and I would type my notes and this is in grade 10. And I went immediately to an A student when I did that. And the fact was, is that I realized that when I was typing in my notes, I was retaining information and I realized that's how I learned. So I've been learning how to actually draw those crochet diagrams, which are really tough by the way. And I would make a sailor blush if you're ever sitting in front of me with the language. Uh, anyway, just trying to get it to go right. But then, click, 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 click. And so I wrote a whole manual for myself on if I want this, I do this. And if I want that, I do that. My point being is that you have to just understand the way that you learn and to be able to fake it. And sometimes the mathematics just suck. And so you just slam in a stitch and you don't tell anybody. There's no, there's no place as far as I know. I'm bad for that for the stitch along. So is there any questions uh, that people would have? Uh, so yeah, I do curse. I even curse at your inspirations at their meetings, but don't tell anybody. Allie's like, ah! 
<laughs> right, Allie? Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> she says, oh, goodness. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, we had a question here. Can you make an enclosed border as you sometimes do in mosaic crochet? Yes, you could, you could do that. Um, you'd have to go back and forth on that, which is actually pretty easy to do. It's just a matter of figuring out the growth. If you were to grow it out like a triangle, how you would grow that out. So Daniel's got this concept in his head, which I'm not sure to ever get out of his head, but he wants to do a mosaic kind of um, border for a shawl, but we can't figure out how to do the mathematics. So it's easy to remember. I think it's one thing to design a Mandela where every row is like, you know, a journey. And it's another thing to design something so it's easy to remember. So we've been trying our really kind of hard to do that. So you could look at, you could look at that. I still have all my mosaic stuff here. So it's just a matter of being able to convert something over if you wanted to, but it's just a matter of figuring out how you're going to get that angle. And actually, I think one of the crochet designers at Your Inspirations was, was working on that. Um, Seema, I think was working on that, Allie. Do you remember that? She was working on it on a shawl. Oh, you remember? Maybe. I maybe it's for next year. It was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Is the mosaic hard to learn? No, no, it's not hard to learn. It's just a matter of just following the boxes along. So we have tutorials on how to do that too. So we have over two thousand free tutorials available on the crochet crowd, and of course, my friends at Yarn Inspirations has a whack more because they have different uh, crochet hosts and knitting hosts, and um, it's really kind of fun that way to be able to learn. So the back of mosaic looks like that. Never forget that. So the back always looks striped, right? So Patty has a great question here about latte cake. She's wondering if you find latte cake scratchy. Um, no, I would actually be naked underneath the blanket of latte cake. It's not like it's scrubby yarn. <laughs> Can you imagine being that? You have a whole exfoliation by the end of you watch your Netflix. Um, no, actually, I really like it. The only the only thing I do have with that, like, we want to keep it real here. I sometimes feel like some of the eyelash, if I keep it my hand too close to the hook, uh, too close to the yarn, I find some of the eyelash just ends up in my hands a little bit because I'm pulling it out by that. Yeah. Um, they are really, really soft. Um, so what's that question? Uh, can we do a class on what? Um, okay, so handouts. So we have... Uh, Dending a, a shawl into a blanket. A shawl into a blanket. We went the other way. If you remember the, um, if you want to pull the link for the fluffy meringue uh, baby blanket, we actually figured out how to do that baby blanket into a shawl. And actually, you know what it looks like? It looks like that virus shawl when it was done just as a, a quarter or just as a half of it. So the, the idea is to be able to do that. Um, so also the um, latte cakes blur the design. So yeah, so for eyelash yarn and stuff, I wouldn't like be worried about doing designs where you're going to see a lot of stitch work. So if you're screwing it up, you know, pull out that eyelash yarn, nobody's ever going to see it. Um, don't think we don't do that either. So it's just one of those particular concepts that you can just try, right? Um, what else do we have for questions? Any, any other questions? Uh, the link for the uh, meringue. Yeah. I've got it right here. The sound keeps getting garbled. It might just be my own voice and the crickets. Um, and just a reminder to get the handouts that Mikey referenced today. You can get them on the Crochet Crowd, and I will be dropping the link here in the chat as well. Yeah, it's the latest article. If you go in the crochetcrowd.com, it's the latest one. It is called, um, just like it's stated on the very top of this, it's the uh, Mikey's Icing on the Cake workshop. And I kind of just wrote my notes. So remember I told you how I learned? I didn't do this for you. I know. I did it for myself so that I could remember the information because this is the way that I learned by, by writing things down and to be able to understand. And then I'm just going to put this in my crochet binder. And when I'm going to design something in the future, I can like just reference, you know, do I want this and this and this? How did I figure out how to do the borders? I can use that as a reference tool. So this is one of those things. I actually have a, a, a manual for learn uh, for design where I, I don't share it with anybody, but I write my own notes and the notes keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's, yeah. So that's kind of a, what I would do for learning. Anybody else learn that way? Yeah. Maybe. Yes, no, maybe so. 
that's kind of what I, oh yeah another border here um so this is called the crochet it for you shawl so this is another one here where the border is really kind of fun and again if you can rip off the one design from this and then convert it to that it's just kind of fun right so lots of different ideas. So there's all kinds of shawls. And now that your inspirations is with Red Heart, there's all kinds of shawls out there. And then they have so many more blankets that designers really kind of do fun stuff, right? Uh, what was the last shawl that I just held up? This is the uh, Crochet It For You shawl. And yes, there's a video tutorial on this already as well, Crochet It For You. And uh, I really enjoyed this one as well. I had a sample here in the studio. I think I put it away, but yeah. Um, so you can put any border on anything basically. So it's the, the whole border is the finishing technique. There's sometimes something is just missing. Sometimes it's just a border, right? So I hopefully that you've learned something today here on uh, here. Um, I have a question. Can I use a solid? What was the question? Uh, so what do I do with all my making stuff? They end up uh, going into donations. Um, sometimes um, this one here was made by a crocheter for me and she wanted to gift me. So that was one of my designs and she did it for that and sent it to me. Uh, please answer, can the twisted be something? What was that, Allie? Um, can the twisted fringe work well on latte cake? I think so, like for sure. I don't have a sample of latte cakes out here. Um, can you imagine that? I, I can't see why it wouldn't. Like for sure. And then Carrie wants to know if she could use a solid color for a border um, when using Karen cakes for the cake off. Oh, um, well, I, I don't know what the rules are as long as it's Karen cakes. But I tell you, I'm notorious that if I like something in a Karen cake ball, I literally, and I want a border of a certain color, I will take out that color and that color and that color. And then I will use it to solid up something. And we do that behind the scenes as well. There's some Karen Cake projects where you see, how in the hell did they get that like one line of just that one strip? And what they do is they take a ball and they deconstruct it and they pull out all the different five colors into many other balls. And then they use it to finish off um, uh, uh, projects. So I've done that too. We do that on the Stitch Along stuff too. Right? Absolutely. Any Virginia wants to know if you can use a border to make a big, a blanket larger. Yeah, for sure. There's some uh, board, uh, blankets that they do. They're like saying it's like 48 inches. I'm like, that's not 48 inches. But then you realize that the border is actually going to be the finishing. Um, we find that with the stitch along those people are like, it's not big enough. And then we do the border and then people are satisfied. So for sure, the border is a great way to be able to grow the project without having to think too hard. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong. I would just recommend if you're ever doing border work, uh, just remember that single crochet ends up ruffling up a lot. Anybody have that, that when you use single crochet around the edge, it always kind of makes it really roughly. And it's because of the tension of the single crochet. So um, on the stitch alongs, when I'm designing, I avoid the single crochet near the end because it always will ruffle. And even though I can sit on it and, you know, steam it down and it will look good as a model, it never really looks good unless you're going to have the same discipline on your side. So you got to remember that certain stitches work really well with each other. Another thing that causes ruffles is the troubles because there's two they're really long and then they end up stacking on top of each other so you just want to watch that to be able to do that and a lot of clothing is done with half double crochet and that seems to keep its balance but again you have to be able to identify the corners to be able to do that so yeah was that a long answer it was perfect <laughs> oh she would say that anyway folks <laughs> yeah so yeah so I don't know. I think you just got to make it or fake it. You know, creativity, like the thing about crochet, my friends, if, if my last message to you, fake it or make it, you know, this is your creativity. It's your journey. You are the artist. And if anybody's judging you for it, they can go take a flying leap somewhere. Really. They have nothing better to do than to criticize you and your crochet projects and your yarn collection. You're an artist. You need those. You need all that yarn. Okay. So if you got like balls and balls coming out of the walls, Welcome to the club. Um, if you don't have balls to the walls, you'll get there eventually, maybe one day. If you don't have, if you have discipline, then lucky for you, you do. Um, I am a sucker for a sale. So I'm like, I have this, I'm going to hook something and I buy it. And then 10 years later, it's still in my collection. 
And, uh, but it's nice to have those choices. But whenever I go to crochet something, I never have the right damn color. So then I have to run out again. And then you buy the color you want, but then I have to buy it sister because it's lonely in the next shelf. And so I find with crochet, there's always something to learn. Um, I had been crocheting since I was 14, I'm now 47. I'm still learning. And I think that's what keeps me addicted to this. I'm, I'm completely addicted, I won't deny it. But I'm addicted because the learning opportunities for this are just amazing. And some stitches I'm just so sick and tired of. I hate the puff stitch. I hate the puff stitch and yet I just did a design with it. Um, but it looks good. So sometimes I have to beat myself up mentally in order to get through something to have the final look. But then, you know, it's always me. I'm the artist, I can change whatever I want. So I'm completely addicted. Um, I just love creativity, but I really never started collecting yarn until my thirties. And then after that, it was all, all hell broke loose. <laughs> get, get me in a tent cell, you're, I'm screwed. Put me in a tent cell of yarn, I'm, I'm done. So I will buy it something because I see people diving into the bin and I will buy it because they can't have it all. It makes no sense, it makes no sense. So it's like, get the hell out of my way, girls. Daddy's got a crochet. And then they start blocking me like a football player. Allie, have you ever been to a tent sale? Not free yarn, but I've been oh. to other ones. <laughs> It's a free for all, especially day number one. It gets ugly. <laughs> yeah, oh I just, and then you get to the till and they say, that's a thousand dollars. And you're just like, okay. And it's like, and then you get in your car and it's like, Christ, I just spent a thousand dollars on yard. What the hell was I thinking? How am I going to explain this when I get home? And then you got to think of all those excuses when you get home. It's like, but I needed it for this and I was going to work on the charity and you pray to God, somebody's going to believe your bull crap. Like really seriously, because you, you know, you know, you don't believe it yourself and you know, you just fall for it, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully next year, they'll start back up the tent sales again. That currently they're not going, but uh, I'm usually a guest host at one of those things. I'm like, keep your hockey sticks on the ground. I saw this fight between these two friends one time. It was so ugly because they had to buy three, get one free. They had five friends, okay? It could not be divided, right? And so if they just would have bought a denomination that would have hit the five, they would all be happy. And this one woman just chewed up one woman's side and down the other because they determined that she wasn't gonna get one because it was like by, uh, by four, whatever. She wasn't gonna get one. It was ugly. I'm like, for God's sakes, it's only $3. Just go buy another ball. But you know what? She was having a, a BF. <laughs> It was awesome. It was awesome. So it's a lot of fun uh, when you come with these tent sales. Yarn, you know, you get talk, people talking in the aisles and it is so much fun um, to be able to hear other people's creativity. But, you know, if it's on sale and you see just a few and somebody's like glancing and you know you want it, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll sneak in and buy it just because I'm a bitch. <laughs> uh, that's just one of those things, you know, because somebody would do it to me for sure. So that's kind of my thing. So, okay. Ali, I think that's it for today. It's uh, Michael on behalf of the Crochet Crowd. Um, if you did not like my presentation, my name is David Porter, okay? And I work for um, Weave It or Leave It. And if you really liked our presentation, just let us know here at Michael's and uh, Yarn Inspirations. Um, I, I'm just an everyday crafter like you, just with the mouthpiece and just with a little bit of extra yarn. And my passion is to teach crochet and just make it okay that, you know, everybody loves everyday yarn just like I do. And Michael's makes that happen. And Yarn Inspirations with all those free designs, I'm gonna be hooking until I'm in the box. And there better be a crochet box or a hook in my burial for sure. So have a great afternoon. And it's now six o'clock my time zone. Let's all wave goodbye to each other. We see each other. And see you later, Kathy Jones and Angela and Julia and all of you there, there today. So have a great day and we'll see you. Bye, everyone.